Why did Jesus call fishermen? It wasn't simply happenstance. It wasn't just that he was passing by on the sea and said, oh, here's a couple of guys that look like they need a job. I'll pick them. No. Jesus, who is God, is very intentional about what he does. And so he chooses four men to be his first followers who are men of the sea, fishermen, hardworking, blue-collar dudes who earn their living by the sweat of their brow, the smelly sweat of their brow. Why did the Lord choose these particular men in this particular line of work? Well, I'd like to offer several reflections about why I think the Lord might have chosen this occupation as the first princes of the, of, the, of the church. Four reflections that not only touch upon the need for bishops to have these particular attributes, bishops, of course, who are successors of these fishermen, but you and me as Christians, as individuals who are called by our lives to fish for souls, who are called by our lives and our compassion and our integrity to draw others to Jesus. Number one, fishermen, as best as I can tell, certainly men like Peter, James, John, Andrew, who appear to have a, a business of fishing, they weren't just fishing on the weekends, work really, really hard. These are men who know what it is like to earn their keep by their own labor. They're not being provided anything from anyone. They've got to go get it. And if their family's going to eat, they need to wake up before dawn and go to bed after dark. They're working constantly, constantly thinking about the next day's work, troubled by what might be or what might not be, and always willing to go out farther to find new flocks of fish that they might bring back and feed their families with and support their communities with. These are men who know what it is like to sweat and to work. So too for every single Christian. We also must be about the business of working. Far too many of us, politicians and everybody else, lives the faith as a cultural phenomenon. Perhaps we were, we were raised Catholic, culturally Catholic. This isn't enough. To be Catholic, to be Christian, to follow the Lord is hard. The Lord is quite clear. If you would be my disciple, you must pick up your cross and follow me. That entails work, effort, struggle. Struggle against oneself, first of all, and against the attitudes and brokenness of the world. We must fight against the desire for vengeance and reach out in compassion. That requires work. We must work about the business of conquering ourselves and our passions. Boy, oh boy, let me tell you, that's work. We must be about the business of being with one another. That's work. To be a follower of Jesus, to take it seriously, requires more than Sunday Mass, critical as that is, critical. It requires a willingness to work hard and to feel the weight of the day as we seek to bring others to Jesus in the fields in which the Lord has sent us, the lakes and the seas to which the Lord has sent us, our family, our community. Are we willing to work? Are we willing to work? If not, the Christian way of life is not for us. The Lord invites us to labor with him, to labor with him. Number two. These fishermen know what it is like to rely upon God. They know that, yes, they must work hard. They must do their part. But at some fundamental level, they rely upon God for everything. The sea, the fish, the weather, everything, their health, everything, they rely upon God for it. It's often been reflected that just as you will not find an atheist in a foxhole, you won't find an atheist on the farm field. Because farmers know of their radical dependence upon the divine graces of God, upon his providence, upon his love, upon his care, sometimes mysteriously shown. But the farmer and the fisherman know that they rely upon God. So too the Christian. Yes, we must be about the business of work, laboring for the kingdom of God. 
but it is God's work. And the more that we can surrender what we can't control and let God take over, my goodness, the better. So much anxiety in our world, so much anxiety in our world is inspired by things that we don't have a single thing to say in. And yet we're so wound up about it. We must be about the business of being concerned about what we can control. You know, like your wife knows that she's loved. Like your husband knows that he's valued. Like your kid knows that they're called to be a saint. That your community and your parish know that you actually care about it. These are the things that we must strive to control and let go of the rest to the degree that we can and give it over to God. God is in control. I know it's sometimes a fishy proposition. I get it. But he is in control. Jesus knows what he is about. And he is with us. A reliance upon God, a trust in the Almighty. Number three, and there are four for those who are keeping track. Number three, fishermen begin again and again and again and again. Peter, James, Andrew, John, I got to think, there were many days when they came back in from the sea and they got nothing. They got nothing. And yet, they began again the next day. We actually see one such situation in the gospel. Jesus says to them, have you caught some fish? And Peter kind of waves them off. No, we've caught nothing, nothing. And Jesus sends them back out and they find a great load of fish. But it shows us that there were moments where there was great failure. That these men knew what it is like to fail, to go out, to kiss their wives, go out into the sea, to come back and to have nothing. How humiliating that must have been. But they didn't stop there. They got back up and they went out again and they brought home dinner. I've been watching some shows about world famous athletes. And one of the themes that comes across with some regularity is that many of the great ones, many of the great ones, had a tremendous amount of failure, tremendous amount. But you don't read about those failures. You read about the great successes and the summits. So too in the Christian way of life. A thousand times we may fall and a thousand times we must get up. Discouragement never comes from God. It always comes from the devil or from pride. The devil will remind us of our brokenness, rub our face in it, or our own stupid pride where we think, boy, I really should be beyond this by now. You're an infant. You're a spiritual infant. Deal with it. You're a baby in the spiritual life. Take baby steps. We're all in need of God's mercy and of God's love and of God's patience. And the more we can understand that and accept that, the more we can move on and grow and become the saints we are called to be. Again and again and again, we fall, we go to confession, we get back up. We fall, we go to confession, we get back up. This is not to paste over brokenness or habitual sin, which must be tackled. It is to acknowledge our own frailty, and that by only acknowledging that frailty will we come to be the disciples we are called to be. I have come to call sinners, not the righteous. I have come to call sinners, not the righteous. Finally, I promise you finally, brotherhood. These fishermen are together with their brothers. In both interesting instances, both Peter and John are with their brothers, Andrew and James. They're not alone. They're together with their brother, and they are working with their brother. The Christian way of life cannot be lived alone. I wish it could, let me tell you. I wish it could, but it can't be. It must be lived with others. What's the old expression? A a cord. If it's one single string, it will snap. But if it is several strings woven together, it can lift great, great measurements, great weights. So too with the Christian way of life. We need each other. It is very challenging when we are adults to develop Christian friendships. They're easier when we're in college or when we're in high school even. Members of uh, youth groups or whatever. But when we get older, it becomes very challenging. We're all going in our different directions. And so it's more important than ever as adults to be intentional about developing Christian friendships. 
participating in small groups to the degree that we can or are comfortable with. All I mean by that is a group of Christian friends who talk about real things, who talk about serious things. My brothers and sisters, it can't be lived alone. The waves of the sea are just too high. We need each other. The fishermen knew that, and we must accept it. My dear friends, all of us have been called from the boats of our interests, the boats of our own littleness, the boats of our own uh, hang-ups to follow Jesus, to follow him. And in so doing, we must imitate the example and the virtues of those first cussing, dirty, smelly fishermen. They knew the value of hard work. They relied upon God. They knew the importance of beginning again and again and again. And they knew the importance of brotherhood, not just for enjoyment, but for their livelihood. So too with us. As we go out into the sea of our lives, as the waves crush upon us and crash and are all around us, let us remember that the Lord is with us. And he is the one who has called us to go out and to bring many souls to Jesus This Jesus who is worth everything. This Jesus who is the shore towards which we row and which will be our happiness forever.